this trader was up 140 odd thousand pounds and it ended up this trade only banking him 20. You could have a trader that had been in that position and that scenario was a complete mess. Well, why didn't he or she or they trail their stops up more? Yes. more? Could be directly related to the amount of money that was involved. Oh, you I'm not going, even, we're not going to Zion National Park now. <laughs> Welcome to the Traders Clinic, your regular shot in the arm of Trader Insights, philosophy and knowledge, brought to you by two professional money managers, Ali Crooks and Charlie Burton. On each show, we cover all things from the world of trading and answer your burning trading questions. Well, that was a bit of a bit of a bombshell start. 140k. Yeah, I know. 20. This trader must have been stupid. You'd have... Actually, if you take a line like that, just with that piece of information then I would say, oh yeah, maybe there's something wrong. <laughs> because you, you, know, you, you see a trader being up a, a, a given amount and then giving back a lot of the open profits, then you could say, is there greed going on? Uh, you know, all of these mm. sort of things. So what you, you or I would do if we were talking to this trader, we, the first thing we'd, we'd need to understand more of the story. Yeah. So that's a headline grabbing mm. thing. The trader was up a reasonable, you know, a, a good amount relative to how much they ended up with. So they gave back a lot of the open profit, but um, we would need to know more information. Yeah, Con I think the key thing here is context. Right. In terms of how to be, like you said, you could have a trader that had been in that position and that scenario was a complete mess and they'd gone against their rules, they've broken their rules, and as a result, they've lost all this profit, and mm. it, it, it was a compl the completely wrong thing to do. But for another trader, completely part of the plan, well, which is, I yeah, think, what's I, key about this. Yeah, and I think if you, one thing is, from a context perspective, is to say, well, okay, that trader may have been up 140, but what was their plan? What exactly. was their trade plan? So, and then you find out, well, the trade plan was that they had targets, they, you know, they were just following their trade plan, and their trade plan it would have ended up being probably around about 200,000 in total as far as the profit was concerned. So all they were doing was trading their plan. So you're like, oh, okay, all right. But what about, and the first thing that a lot of people who are watching this will say, well, why didn't he or she or they trail their stops up more? Yes. more? And so there are these other other things. Um, I think the first thing to say is, I've got to hold my hands up, it was me. <laughs> so, um, but when I say hold my hands up, um, I think when you, when you have a trade like that, that was on for being one of my biggest ever trades. Um, well, it would have been if it had hit target. And those are the sort of trades, I often say these big mm. multiple R trades, are the trades that don't just make your month, they make your year. And so when you have a singular trade like that, but they don't come along very often. And one thing that a lot of traders, I think, go down a rabbit hole with is they always want to find something to fix. It's in us as human beings. Yes, very Something true. goes wrong, we've got to fix it. You know, I'm married, you're married. You know, <laughs> if, sometimes our wives don't want us to fix what the yes, issue exactly. is. You know? think, yeah. And there's not necessarily something to fix. So. And again, if on a trade like this, well, if I was just following my plan, there's not necessarily something to fix. And yet a lot of people would, but oh, well, next time I'm gonna trail my stops up. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's a different trade plan. Yeah. And, that, and the challenge is, is in that scenario, you've got the, the want and desire to potentially trail your stop could be directly related to the amount of money that was involved. So a trade, but if a trade is responding to the fact that they were up 140 well you were up and you went well next time because i didn't make all that money i'm going to trail my stuff up wrong decision because yeah. they're making the decision purely on the amount of money that was that was falsely in their mind lost and what yes. was interesting is when we spoke a couple of days after yeah. the trade had rolled back over mm. there was obviously you would have loved to have banked the money of course. but you know yeah. that's that's human we nature. were laughing about that yeah, like, oh, i'm not going to even we're not going to our national park now <laughs> Yeah, that's our, that's our, that's our <laughs> that was trip ruined. That was giving me my little treat. <laughs> anyway, sorry. But what was interesting was that you weren't, your response was, wasn't, ah, right, well, what I need to do next time is uh, change X, change Y, or trail my stop. And I see that so many times with traders when they're talking about a £1,400 profit or even a £140 profit is the trade didn't work out, so therefore I now need to change what I'm doing. Yeah. And I think that's the, the, the key thing that, 
that I got when I spoke to you was that just naturally you were like, well, that was that, you know, mm. on to the next one rather than something must be wrong, I need to change it. So you weren't responding to the money or responding to the R. Because sometimes it's not the money for a trader with a smaller account, it's, it's uh, you know, a big R trade. I talk about the money a lot of time to shock people mm. just because I know a lot of traders aren't in those types yeah. of trades. So um, it's, it creates, a t <laughs> it, it, builds attention from people to say, oh, oh my God, what, you know. But then you change the context and say, well, if you were up 5R in a trade, forget the money now, and you're just yeah. talking about 5R, and you'd moved your stop to, let's say, 1R, and it rolled back over, yeah, it wouldn't be, you know, you, know, you would have rather had the 5R, but, you know, that's just what happens if you're going to be trading looking for 5R-type mm -hmm. returns that not all of them are going to get there. Some of them are going to go... Um, a certain, or let's say 5R and it rolls back to 1, but your target was 9R, well, okay, it looks, it sounds reasonable to me because if you move yes. your stop up to 4R, you're almost guaranteeing you're never going to get to 9R. Exactly. Pretty much, you know, it'd be very, very, very rare. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we're going to lead into this about the types of trader and you've got to yes. understand who you are as a trader. So there's nothing wrong with being more aggressive on trading stops it's just a different approach mm -hmm. and and i think and like you hinted at uh, there when i reflect on trades like that i'll just shrug it off and say well yeah it would have been lovely to have had the money and i'll laugh about it because i think you have to yeah. otherwise you'd be in there crying <laughs> but um but really you know that you're you're just one step to the next trade that's just one step to the next trade which might be bigger smaller whatever it doesn't matter there's always going to be another trade. And if you look at, to use the old Mark Douglas stuff that's in his books, Trading in the Zone, just look at it as one trade in the next out of 100 trades. So if you had 100 trades like that, some of them are going to go and hit those targets. But then there's going to be others that just never even get into profit at all and are straight stop outs. And others like that one, which are going to get quite close to the targets and then roll over. Unfortunately, you can't have your cake and eat it. If you trail your stops up too much, you're never going to get those bigger ones. But you don't have to. You don't have to have those bigger ones either. But that's that's what's so interesting about this whole discussion is the level of ownership you have over the way that you trade. So you're willing to have one of the let's let's say for sake of argument, one of those trades a year. Yep. And you're willing to have a higher amount of losers to get the one trade and not just get the trade that runs 50 R but manage your stop accordingly to give the trade the room to reach that point. Yes. So a trader listening to that who's trailing their stops one one R ratio behind price for yeah. sake of argument yeah. is then sitting there going, well, I want a piece of that. Well, I'm like, well, do you? Because you're mm -hmm. going to have to completely change the way you operate. And that's what and you, you made the point that traders can't have their cake and eat it. Well, I often see traders wanting it all. Yeah. Whatever, they're, whatever they're doing, they want to be doing what the other person is doing, but they haven't actually fully, um, fully understood what that person well, the other trader has to go through to achieve that. But in that moment, they go 140 grand or 200 grand trade or 50 R trade. I want that. Well, have you do you want it because you don't fully own what you're doing or is it is it purely greed? Because it's, it's a different way. It's a different way of trading. And well, you've got to earn the right yeah. to be able to. But as we know from some of the greatest investors, that's actually not a bad philosophy to have. And so many newer traders are looking for the answer. I'd have had a load of people saying, I want that. I then spend my time trying to say to them, yes, but you've got to put up with all those ones that don't, and like we say. It's grand plan, I write by, by year 10 or year 20, I'm going to start doing this. My short-term trading performance versus my swing trading performance, I thought, actually, the swing trading, do I need to be doing... You said this over coffee earlier on. We've used this and this, that, that saying a lot over the years. Earn the right to be able to do that type of trading. Plus, you don't have to. Exactly. Um, the is someone who trails their stops aggressively behind price, that may suit their trading personality. Mm. And actually, sitting in trades not massively aggressively moving up stops in order to give them that room to get to their much higher potential targets, if, you've, if that's part of the, that trade and that analysis and whatever that trade plan is, then you've got to give them that bigger room to breathe, which by default means you can have a lower win rate. But so it doesn't mean that um, someone who's trading their stop is wrong by any means. 
they'll just have a slightly higher win rate and they won't get those massive winners. But does that matter? They're going to have a few more average winners or good winners, solid winners along the way, but they're never going to get those, those huge runs that you can get. But you, for me, we were talking about this earlier on, and we've said this many times, trading for me is much deeper than just trying to make money. Absolutely. It's, for me, it's the, the personal mental challenge of pitting myself against the market, so to speak. And really, you're pitting yourself against yourself. That's what it's about. Because I got to this point, you know, 15 years into my trading, where I, I wasn't getting the mental stimulus from the short-term trading. So I can do short-term trading, but it didn't mean anything to me. Whereas for me, trading needs to be, I need to have something deeper from it, which sounds a bit, oh, you know, just a lot of people just want to make money from trading. But yes, of course, I want to make money from trading, but I want to push myself. I need to keep myself interested and pushed. And one way of doing that is to set these challenges for me, a challenge of holding on to trades, um, because that is one of the most difficult things for people to do. There's a, there was an experiment on this very thing um, done in, I think it was in New York in the 1990s, and it was all about uh, delayed gratification. And this university, they went around the streets of New York and they were handing out $10, $10 to people saying, look, we'll give you $10 now, or if you wait a couple of weeks, we'll give you $20. And something like 70 or 80% of the people said, no, I'll take the 10 bucks now. Yeah. And it's that whole thing about delayed gratification. It's hard because as humans, when you go back to our you know, ancestors and ancestral types, um, then they didn't know when food was ne next going to arrive. And so when the food was there, we would gorge ourselves. That's what we would do. We're programmed to. We are pre-programmed to do like all animals are. And so it's hard to actually say, no, I'm not going to take that right now. I'm going to wait. And, um, but as we know from some of the greatest investors, that's actually not a bad philosophy to have. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, I've seen I've seeing a, po a post on Instagram about the, the the guy I forget his name. The guy from the Big Short who uh, yeah who Michael Burry yeah that's it who predicted the crash. Mm. And interestingly, there's there's rumours that he's predicting another crash. And so many of the comments he's doing were, that for last year exactly. So many of the comments were he's wrong, he's wrong, and he's or, or he's been wrong more times than he's right. Mm. And my initial response was. Uh, well, that's most traders. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, the comments like, "Well, don't don't listen to him. He's wrong more than he's right." <laughs> yeah. and, um, and it's and it's but and also there's there's a willingness for the successful traders to do that. It was very much like the start of start of my year. You know, I was basically from a results point of view, from a, a pure percentage return, I was wrong for the first quarter. But I didn't go into to quarter two changing what I was doing. It's like you, yeah, you were. From a results point of view, you were wrong on that trade. It didn't reach your target, but you've not then to said, right, well, now I'm going to change my approach. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of traders will look at the, the home run, the home run trade and go, well, I want that. Well, are you going to deal with six retracements over a, a, a three month period, a four month period? You know, are you going to deal with price retracing 30 percent, seeing your profits diminish? Are you going to be able to cope with adding into that trade? You know, you've had your first part of the trade, then it it gets you into a risk-free position and then it sets up again and you're adding in and you're doing this. So there's so many facets that the trader doesn't look at. They just see, oh, I, I'd like a bit of, I'd like, I'd like 50R, you know. It, it's the same with, you know, you take Usain Bolt and people see that amazing sprinter, you know, with all those results that he had, but they forget the fact, they don't see the fact that all the training that he did over the years and the fact that he was sprint, uh, running from the age of five. And you know, to, all they see is that, that end result. And like you said, if my trade had gone to target, I'd have had a load of people saying, I want that, uh, that's what I want. And I, I then spend my time trying to say to them, yes, but you've got to put up with all those ones that don't, <laughs> like we say. Yeah. And so it's good for us to be able to share this sort of stuff. I don't think that every trader should be going for those big, Absolutely. ultra high risk reward ratio trades, because they're not, it's not, one is that they may not be ready for it, but they might be ready in a few, in the future, but two, some traders won't ever need to be ready for it and don't want it. It's not congruent with who they are as a person and, and who they are as a trader. So that then brings us on to understanding yourself as a trader. Now, someone who's only just got into trading, maybe in the last year, two years, they're still learning who they are as a trader. And, and you said this earlier on, well, you've just got to be at the coalface in order to find out who you are because you won't know straight away 
So, and so many newer traders are looking for the answer without actually going out there and experimenting to see. I mean, the underlying thing here is discipline. The one thing I can, the one thing I can take from the bigger trades I had in April and this trade you've, you've, you, you were in and then it rolled over and the lo losing period is there was a maintenance of discipline in terms of following your plan. There wasn't a change in response. So those guys who, who want the answer up front, you're not going to get it. You need to go out into the market but your core underlying measurement is, are you disciplined in whatever approach you've got? Because if you do move into a different type of trading, holding trades for long, there's going to, you, you, the underlying thing is you need to be disciplined. You can't make a mess of, you know, two to one, two to one trades and then suddenly think, oh, well, I'll just hop to, I'll just hop to trying to trade for 50R. You've got to, I think it's got to, you've got to have had some track record at doing something that was potentially less taxing before you then, you then make the jump and like you say they don't have to they could stay you no. know, in that area but if there's not an underlying disciplined approach to what they're doing they're probably gonna they're not gonna make a success of those those bigger trades no and as so often is the case with trading start off with your two r's and get used to being more comfortable with that sort of target and then you gradually build up over time mm. rather than saying right my next trade i'm going for a 20r or 50r or whatever um because it is tough mentally to be able to do that and it's and it's evolved for you i'm assuming what yeah. you, you didn't set out with this pl this grand yeah. plan i right by by year 10 or year 20 i'm going to start doing this it was just it just evolved that way yeah um uh, one one thing that i noticed we were talking earlier on it was about 10 years ago when i first started doing these larger swing trades and then looking at my my short-term trading performance versus my swing trading performance I thought actually the swing trading do I need to be doing it's not that there's not short trading term trading performance there but do I need that because this is actually pretty good over here as well and then I can free up more time by not doing all the the intensity of that if this now the the results from this might come a little bit more in a jagged kind of way because of by default if you're swing trading then you're holding on to positions for longer so you're having to wait again for that that delayed gratification to find out whether you know you've made x amount or whatever so but it does come it just takes a little bit longer you're not going to have that instant result that if you're a day trader and you've just spent the week day trading that you've all oh, right i've made x amount this week well that's not going to be the same for a swing trader but the they get to the same result if not better um depending on on the individual so yeah these things do evolve over time but coming back to what i said earlier on for me there's there's more to it than than the money for me in in trading so th for me i get a better mental stimulus from looking and i'm not every trade that i take is these are these ultra big ones but when i see the when the analysis comes in and i see the potential for these ultra big risk rewards then great because that does give me a lot of stimulus and um, for me i i need that from my trading as well as just trying to make money yeah more than just the money absolutely great. absolutely anything else to add no we're good so right well on that note i don't think there's much else to add his name's ali crooks his name's Charlie Burton. Trade safely out there.